Hello and thank you for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and this video is on myth and Renaissance lyric. Really with more of a focus on the myth, I'll be talking about a couple key stories from um, ancient Roman literature that were very important to uh, Renaissance lyric and that served as a basis for Petrarch and many other poets in Europe and most particularly in England. So Greek and Roman myth, why was it so important to Renaissance poets, they very much admired it for its great poetic skill and beauty, for the power of just the writing itself of Greek and Roman myth in the original Greek and Latin languages. And they also admired it for its artistic and philosophical insight into human experience. They recognized that the Greeks and Romans had very advanced uh, philosophy and understanding of the world and sciences and as well an insight into human nature and they very much learned from that as well. The stories that we'll be looking at today are from uh, Ovid, the famous Roman poet, and his most famous work, The Metamorphoses, which is a long collection, a narrative collection of myths, um, adapted, mostly adapted from ancient Greek stories, about the extremes of human passion and desire, and the way these passions and desires transform us, metamorphosize us. So the key theme in his work is really desire and the human experience of that desire, what it feels like to want. And he really likes to explore the extremes here. He's exploring the extremes of both pleasure and pain and really the mysteries of desire. That is the way desire can lead us paradoxically. Something that we love can lead us to great suffering um, and that sometimes we don't know why we want things. Sometimes we want things that are bad for us and that hurt us um, and the mystery of where our desires come from. So he's really exploring tensions, exploring paradoxes. And that's one of the things that Renaissance writers so loved about Ovid and uh, ancient Greek and Roman literature was its deft exploration of paradox. They very much believed that when we get into the subject of paradox, where two things that are seemingly opposed are true, then that is when we're reaching towards truth because we're reaching the limits of human experience and into the realms where only the divine can understand. So Renaissance writers really loved Ovid for that. So the first story that we'll talk about, which we've already discussed a little bit in class, is that of Acteon and Diana. And this is a story that I'm subtitling Dismembering Desire. It's about the effects of desire on the self and how desire destroys the individual. And the version that we'll be looking at is uh, that that was translated by Arthur Golding, the first English translation of the Metamorphoses from 1567. So this is the English version that people like Philip Sidney or William Shakespeare would have been reading. It's important to think for a moment about the source, the particular text that we're reading, because of all the different layers of influence and interpretation. Uh, if we want to trace it back, originally we have our ancient Greek myths, which is our source for them. And those are, we don't know where they came from. Some of them were, of course, divide, derived in Greek culture, but many of them came from other cultures, from ancient Mediterranean, African, Near Eastern, or Asian cultures that we don't have uh, textual evidence for. Um, and the ancient Greek myths were then adapted and adopted by the ancient Romans. They took them and made their own versions. So we have the Greeks, which are based on these uh, lost stories that we don't have records of, and then the Romans transformed them and put them to their own cultural purposes for the Roman Empire. And Petrarch and others in the Italian Renaissance then were influenced by the ancient Romans, and they largely had their access to the Greeks through Roman sources. So they're going to the Greeks through the Romans who had themselves adapted and transformed the Greek legacy. So there's a certain remove from those original texts. There's a difference inserted by the act of interpretation and cultural transformation, the way one text is taken out of one cultural context and put in another and made to make sense within a different culture's ideology.
And then on top of that, we have the rest of the European Renaissance, or in particular for our purposes, the English, who were influenced by Petrarch. And we get to our translation that we're looking at. Arthur Golding translates the Metamorphoses from Latin into English. So he's translating Petrarch's source, but he's translating it, he's reading it through the lens of Petrarch's interpretation of that source. He's already been in, influenced by how Petrarch has interpreted the Metamorphoses. So Golding is going back and translating it from that perspective. So it gets really complex when we start to think about where is the original text and where does the meaning coming from and how much of these ideas are from the Greeks, from the Romans, from the uh, Italians, from the English, how many are the ideas are spread throughout all the cultures, it gets a little confusing. And the important point is to think, is to recognize that diversity and that there is no pure original source in, in, a, in a very real sense. Okay, enough of that stuff. Let's read the story. There was a valley thick with pineapple and cypress trees that armed be with prick. Gargaffy hight this shady plot. That's Gargaffy was named this shady plot. Gargaffy was the name of this shady plot. It was a sacred place to chase Diana and the nymphs that waited on her grace. No man alive a trimmer piece of work than that could for his life contrive. Ask yourself, what does the language tell us about the space? How is the space imagined? How is it conceived? And what connotations and expectations does it evoke? Just to give us a few answers here to go with, the setting is described as secret and sacred. So it's a holy space. It's a space that's not profaned by the, the human touch, the human presence, and it's secret, it's exclusive. It's not known. And it's an exclusively feminine space. There are no men there. And we are told that it's so beautiful, it's so well crafted, it's beyond any human skill. There is no human that could have crafted something quite as uh, beautiful as this place. Um, but finally, it's also dangerous because of the prick. And I don't want to push that word too far, but is there a sense in which it's also, despite the feminization of it, it's also masculinized in a certain sense because of its dangerousness. So while Diana, that is Phoebe, and her nymphs are bathing in Gargaphy, Acteon, Cadmus's nephew, arrives. Comes Cadmus's nephew to this thick, and, entering in with sorrow, such was his cursed cruel fate, saw Phoebe where she washed. The damsels at the sight of man quite out of countenance dashed, because they ever one were bare and naked to the quick, did beat their hands against their breasts, and cast out such a shriek that all the wood did ring thereof, and, clinging to their dame, did all they could to hide both her and ache themselves for shame. So note that there's a particular focus here on sight and seeing. The nymphs see him, and they see that they are being seen by him. And it's the male gaze, the male vision, that threatens them with shame. So you might ask yourself, what would make a virgin nymph feel shame? What would threaten her with shame? Or another way to put this, what is the metaphorical significance of Acteon's entrance and his looking at them, his vision? What is he metaphorically doing? by entering into this secret female space and looking at the women. Some further questions. What's the nature of the female voice in this sequence? How is it described? What connotations does it evoke? The way the women express themselves in voice. How do they express themselves? What is the nature of their self-expression? And what do they say, both literally and figuratively? Diana, who though she had her guard of nymphs about her, yet she turned her body from himward, and casting back an angry look, like as she would have sent an arrow at him had she her bow there ready bent, 
pause there for a moment. So what's the image that's used to describe Diana's gaze, Diana's vision? And what's the significance of that? What's the meaning of that? What attributes does it give to her sight? How does it characterize the power of her vision? And how does her vision counter and or compare to Actaeon's? What are the kind of overlaps as well as the tensions or, or oppositions between their two acts of seeing? So she's looking at him as though she would have shot an arrow at him. So wrought she water in her hand, and for to wreak the spite, besprinkled all the head and face of this unlucky knight, and thus forspake the heavy lot that should upon him light. Now make thy vaunt among thy mates, thou sawest Diana bear. Tell if thou can, I give thee leave. Tell hardly, do not spare. So note the use of contrasts, the heavy light pun in the one line. Heavy, it's heavy because it's sad, it's a burden, and it will light upon him, that is, land upon him. The male friends, the mates that Diana talks about versus her female nymphs. The camaraderie of the male friends versus the shame of the female nymphs. And the irony of Diana's command that she commands him to speak the unspeakable. And as we know, she's going to, she tells him to speak when she then makes him unable to speak. She gives him the freedom to speak what he has seen, yet his reaction to what he has seen is to become unable to speak it. So that paradox, again, that tension at the heart of the story. A few further questions. What's the meaning of the word for spake? And this is a particularly um, Renaissance verse, Renaissance word. So this isn't Ovid's word, obviously, because it's English and not Latin. But that word that Golding chooses, why does he use that word? And so a hint here is to break it down in its constituent words, for and spake. And what are the possible connotations when you look at it from those two parts, the different meanings that might arise from the idea of for, um, like before, for example, or foreseeing, uh, to foresee something. All those different meanings, how does that inform the power that we're seeing or reading or hearing in Diana's voice? What are we learning? What attributes does it possess? This done, she makes no further threats, but by and by doth spread a pair of lively old heart's horns upon his sprinkled head. She sharps his ears, she makes his neck both slender, long, and lank. She turns his fingers into feet, his arms to spindle shank. She wraps him in a hairy hide beset with speckled spots, and planteth in him fearfulness. So note here the dismembering description of Actaeon's body. It's described in parts, um, which is something we've seen in Nancy Vickers. Uh, what are the possible meanings that one could derive from the images of his transformation, in particular the horns on the head? If you've studied Shakespeare, that should be an important image to you. And what's the psychology of emotions in this story? That is, are emotions something that come from within? Do they come from outside? Is it more complicated than that? What, is it, what are they saying about what it means to be human? Where do our feelings come from? Why do we feel what we do? Acteon flees from Gargafi and Diana, and when he saw his face and horned temples in the brook, he would have cried, alas! But as for then, no kind of speech out of his lips could pass. He sighed and brayed, for that was then the speech that did remain. So think about the actions that Acteon performs or attempts to perform in this scene. What different meanings might one derive from the image of Acteon looking into the lake? We can think of other myths that this might remind us of, but also just the image of looking at your own image. What happens when you see yourself? What are you seeing? What are you learning? And that takes us to the final question here. What's the tragic irony of, of Acteon's situation? What has he learned? What are the various things that he's learned and seen, both outward and inward?
And what is the result of that upon him? What's the effect of those experiences? His hounds espied him where he was. Then all the kennel fell in round, and every for his part did follow freshly in the chase, more swifter than the wind. He flies through grounds where oftentimes he chased had ere though. Even from his own folk is he fain, alas, to flee away. He strained oftentimes to speak and was about to say, I am Acteon, know your lord and master, sirs, I pray. But use of words and speech did want to utter forth his mind. Note here the use of the word part. Each hound wants its part, which also refers to a part of Acteon. That sense again, the dismemberment and the desire to dismember. What ironies are further developed in this sweet sequence in terms of Acteon's situation? And what's the significance of what he wants to say but cannot say? And in particular, think about this as an allegory of inner experience, as a psychological story, we might say. What does it mean that he wants to say those particular words? What is he saying to them? What is he saying to himself or to different parts of himself? They hem him in on every side, and in the shape of stag, with greedy teeth and gripping paws, their lord in pieces drag. So fierce was cruel Phoebe's wrath, it could not be allayed, till of his fault by bitter death the ransom he had paid. Consider Ovid's story, again, as an allegory of the experience of desire, of the inner experience, the psychological experiences of desire, but particularly from a masculine patriarchal perspective. And from that perspective, what fears does it reveal? What fears associated with femininity, with the female body, with female desire? What does Acteon have to do in order to satisfy Diana? What's the experience of this desire of female desire? What is it like for the male to see female desire, to come into contact with femininity? And how does this story, even though things don't end up well for Acteon, how does it serve in and of itself, even before we get to Petrarch's modification, as a sort of means of coping with or explaining or dealing with those anxieties, those masculine fears, that the story expresses. So let's look at a few visual representations, some artistic representations of this myth from the Renaissance. This is one that is believed to be by Luca Penny, an Italian artist from the mid 16th century called the Metamorphosis of Acteon. Um, and it has this wonderful, very busy Renaissance uh, frame around it with all sorts of images. But in the center, we have, again, a very elaborate image of Acteon in mid transformation being splashed. And we can see the water um, from Diana's hand being uh, launching over to Acteon. Acteon's breast, um, and he is again in mid transformation um, as he is gazing at them. And it has the Latin motto, Dominum Cognoscite Vestrum, which means recognize your master. That's what uh, Acteon tries to say to his dogs. Uh, rather interesting that it's used as the motto for this image when instead Diana is splashing him. So, a reversal who is the true master? Is it the man or the woman, or rather the desire that the woman represents. This is a, a rather cute one by uh, Augustin Hirschvogel, um, an artist I don't know much about. 1545 is when this is dated to, Acteon turned into a stag, and we see him here again partially transformed. It's interesting that in this one and the last one we see Acteon as still mostly human. It's the head that has been turned into an animal. Um, so his body is human, but his head is animal, um, yet that makes him, does that make him less human, more animal? What exactly has he become there? Um, and here we see his dogs uh, attacking him, uh, but this one I like because the dogs seem rather cute, it seems rather playful. This doesn't really um, uh, give us much sense of the danger associated uh, and the, the tragedy of what happens to Acteon, um, but it's an interesting little image nonetheless.
And here's another engraving by Isaac Briot, uh, Acteon changed into a stag from 1619. And here Acteon is, is very human. He only has the horns. Um, he doesn't have the head of the stag yet, as he does in the previous two. And uh, we see all the women gazing at him. And the dogs here are still, uh, if we notice one dog is playfully barking at Diana, um, and the other is starting to look at Acteon. Uh, so that split between the dogs, that um, his desires, if we, if we think of the dogs as an allegorical representation of man's inner animal desires, they're partially directed at Diana, but they're partially tarting, starting to turn back towards himself and the eventual dismemberment of himself that will occur when he loses control of his desires. So even though it's a static image, we can see the transformation being enacted um, very, very uh, uh, cleverly by the mixed attention of the dogs. This final image from the early 17th century by Antonio Tempesta, Actian killed by his dogs. Um, this one is, I think, the only one that really that we've seen that captures the horror of the story and the horror of Actian's experience. And interestingly enough, it's because we see him here completely as an animal. He is not uh, has no human features uh, except perhaps his eyes, we might say. But he is uh, completely transformed already into the body of the stag, not as in the three previous images, part human, part stag. Um, and we see the dogs here ripping at his flesh. We see the the eye of the uh, stag open in terror, his mouth open as he's howling in pain. The dogs look pretty vicious and lean, like they're hungry. They're starving animals that are just ready to rip him apart. And we even see his two friends um, or former friends coming behind also following on the hunt. So this is the most uh, horrific, I'd say, of all the images because of the way it, it really shows the, the final act of dismemberment, of death uh, and destruction that Acteon experiences after his transgression of Diana's space. The second story that we'll look at, which we haven't talked about in class, is that of Apollo and Daphne, um, also from Ovid's Metamorphosis. And this is a story that's much more explicitly about poetic recuperation, also about desire, but it ends not with dismemberment, but, dismemberment, but reconstruction. First, some background. In the Metamorphoses, this story comes as the explanation, the mythic story of the creation of the laurel tree. And the laurel tree was very important in Roman culture because it was uh, the tree that was associated with great honor. They would make a wreath, um, uh, you know, a headband, essentially, of laurel branches and leaves, and that was given as a uh, badge of honor, as a sign of triumph to victorious generals, champion athletes, great poets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's where the term poet laureate comes from, the poet who has been given the laurel wreath, who has been declared the victor, the greatest poet. So that's some of the cultural background to this story. And just some brief narrative background. Um, the story is about a conflict between Phoebus, Apollo, the god of the sun, and Cupid, the god of love. And they are both archers. They both carry bow and arrows. And Phoebus mocks Cupid, who is, of course, a small boy, a little baby, flying baby. Uh, Phoebus mocks him for being a small boy and basically tells him to leave the real archery to the men, to the warriors. And he mocks Cupid's ability as an archer. And, of course, Cupid wants vengeance. He wants revenge for, for this. And so this is the story of Cupid's revenge. Penae and Daphne, Penaeus is, is where she's from. So Penae and Daphne was the first where Phoebus set his love, which not blind chance, but Cupid's fierce and cruel wrath did move. From his quiver full of shafts, two arrows did Cupid take of sundry works. To one causeth love, to other doth it slake. That causeth love is all of gold with point full sharp and bright. That, that chaseth love is blunt whose steel with leaden head is dight. <laughs> 
So some questions. How is the background situation in this story? Consider the different causes that are given between what happens to Apollo and what causes what happens to Actaeon. What's the setup for their stories? And in particular, how does the fact that in Apollo's story, it's male-male conflict, how does that change the nature of the story? What added information, what added details does that give us? What additional meanings does it produce? And perhaps we might say, what different aspect of desire is this story exploring? Given that in the first story, we just had Actaeon and Diana, and here we have sort of a triangle between Act, uh, Apollo, Cupid, and Daphne, what differing sorts of desire is this story talking about? The god, this lead arrow in the nymph Peneus for the nonce at once, so saying basically the god shot uh, the leaden arrow into Daphne immediately. That other pierced Apollo's heart and overwrought his bones. Immediately in the smoldering heat of love that one did swelt. Again, that other in her heart no spark, no nor motion felt. So compare this story's psychology of emotions to that of the previous story. You probably find they're very similar. They're the same, essentially. What does this psychology of emotion, the way in which emotions are created the way in which we experience them. What does it tell us about Roman ideas of the self? How are they trying to understand where emotion comes from? How humans live in and react to the world? And what are the consequences of such a psychology? That is, if you believe that, if that's true about how humans experience things, about where emotions come from and how we experience them and what we do with them, what their effects are on us, what else is true? about the world? What should we do about that? What would that lead us to believe about each other, about the way we should interact with each other, about the way society should be structured, etc., etc.? So imagine the world from this perspective. Apollo loves and longs to have this Daphne to his fair, that is, as his, as his love. And as he longs, he hopes, but his four dooms do fail him there. So into flames the god is gone, and burneth in his breast, and feeds his vain and barren love in hoping for the best. He sees her eyes as bright as fire, the stars to represent. He sees her mouth, which to have seen he holds him not content. Her lily arms mid-part and more above the elbow bare, her hands, her fingers, and her wrists, him thought of beauty rare. And sure he thought such other parts, as garments then did hide, excelled greatly all the rest, which he, the which he had espied. But swifter than the whirling wind she flees and will not stay. So what does Phoebus see, and how does he experience this vision? That is, what's the effect of seeing her mouth, her elbow, her arms, etc., upon him? And what does Phoebus not see? What does he imagine? What does he think about what he doesn't see, what he can't see? How does it affect him? And is there a certain paradox there? If we talked in class about the veil, what's going on here in terms of what Phoebus can't see? And again, compare the role of vision and the shifting power dynamics of sight, how sight can be empowering, but also uh, something that, that victimizes you. Sight can give you power or take away your power. Think about how vision uh, operates in this story to serve, to illustrate the relationships between characters and how it works in the story of Actaeon and Diana. So while Daphne is pursued, she prays um, that she'll either be swallowed by the earth or transformed into something so that she will not be able to be uh, essentially raped by Apollo. This piteous prayer scarce said, her sinews waxed stark, and therewithal about her breast did grow a tender bark. Her hair was turned into leaves, her arms and boughs did grow, her feet that were erewhile so swift, now rooted were as slow. Her crown became the top, and thus of that she erst had been, remained nothing in the world but beauty 
fresh and green. So questions, think about what's the nature of the female voice in this story and compare the power of the female voice and the source of that power in this story and the one, uh, the female voice in Diana and Acteon's story. How is Daphne's transformation described here? What happens to her? And what of her transforms and what remains? What's significant about how that's described? Does it remind you of anything? Does it spur any other ideas? Which when that Phoebus did behold, affection did so move, the tree to which his love was turned, he could no less but love. Though my fair and spouse thou cannot be, assuredly from this time forth, yet shalt thou be my tree. Again, now from Apollo's perspective, what has been transformed and what remains? Or another way to put it, what happens to Phoebus and his desire? And how does this story resonate with the ideas of Neoplatonism? That's not to say that this is a strict Neoplatonic poem, but it deals in many of the same ideas and it might come to some similar conclusions or draw on some similar logics as Neoplatonism. So how does it resonate with Neoplatonism? What does it remind you of in Neoplatonic thought? Apollo continues on, Thou shalt adorn my golden locks and ache my pleasant harp, Thou shalt adorn my quiver full of shafts and arrows sharp. And as my head is never pulled, nor never more without a seemly bush of youthful hair that spreadeth round about, even so this honor give I thee, continually to have thy branches clad from time to time with leaves both fresh and brave. So he's saying, I'll, you'll, I'll wear your leaves around my hair and around my harp and around my quiver of, of arrows. And because I always have beautiful long hair, you will be evergreen. You will always have your leaves all year round. So instead of making her his lover, to what use does Apollo put Daphne, both literally and figuratively? We literally see what he does, but figuratively, what is he making her into if she's not his sexual partner? And note in particular the images he uses to describe her new role. What is she associated with? And what do those things, what associations do those things evoke in you? And how does Apollo describe Daphne's new status? What is his masculine perspective on the situation and their new relationship? How does he view what has happened? Now, when that pan of his talk had fully made an end, the laurel to his just request did seem to condescend by bowing of her new made bows and tender branches down and wagging of her seemly top as if it were her crown. So once more, what has been transformed literally and figuratively and what remains the same? How does the narrator describe the new status quo between Apollo and Daphne? What is his perspective on it? What does he say about Apollo's words? And at the same time, are there any contradictions? Does he undermine his own, own point of view? Does he present one perspective on this new situation, but then challenge that in another breath? And what's the tragic irony of Daphne's situation? Is her prayer answered? Is her desire, or should we say her lack of desire, has that been fulfilled? What about Apollo? Is his desire filled? In what way? What about Cupid? Has his desire been fulfilled? Has he achieved his vengeance? I'll give you a hint here. The answer to all these questions is yes and no, in, in a certain sense. But think about the different ways you can answer these questions and why it's so complex and what the importance of that complexity is. Now, just as Nancy Vickers in her article talked about the Acteon Diana myth as the basis for uh, a poetic identity, as an allegory in some sense for the vocation of poetry, how is this poem, this story also serve as an allegory for the vocation of poetry? Um, and think about these two stories together. What, what are the different paths to poetry? What causes poetry? What leads one? What calls one to become a poet or singer? Uh, 
And what's the relationship between desire and poetry, between unfulfilled desire and poetry? What does poetry do with that desire? What does it do for the poet? What does it do for the audience? And think about all these things in these stories and then how in our readings of people like Sidney or Shakespeare or anyone, how do they then use these myths and adapt these myths for their own purposes to talk about their identities as poet and the way they become poets, their callings as poets. Again, let's look at some images of this myth. So here is a painting from 1500 by an anonymous, uh, probably Italian master. We don't know who painted it. Um, at least I couldn't find out. Um, and this is called Daphne Fleeing from Apollo. And as we can see, it's a Renaissance painting and it's been adapted to Renaissance times. They're very clearly wearing um, 14th century clothing 15th century clothing, um, not the clothing of ancient Rome. And we see them uh, roughly on either side. The, the, they each take up half of the image. It's a nicely balanced image with the tree right in the center. Uh, Daphne looking back at Apollo as she starts to transform into the laurel wreath and almost looking as though she's being ascending up into heaven, being taken away. Um, uh, her feet starting to lift off the ground, which is ironic given that she is becoming a tree and thus more rooted to the ground. So a, a slight kind of paradox there. Um, and Apollo reaching out as he is running towards her, trying to, to grab his love, but of course too far from her. Here's another image from 1515 by Agostino Musi um, called Apollo and Daphne. And this one is much more of a mix of Renaissance and uh, ancient Greek and Roman aesthetics. Um, they're very curvaceous characters. Their anatomy is very much like Renaissance, but there's also the sort of nudity that we associate with classical art. Um, and some of the, the, the hair and, and some of the accoutrements that they have is much more similar to classical art than Renaissance. But in any case, we see here again in the midst of transformation. And here it's a much more painful looking transformation as opposed to the previous image where Daphne was almost being lifted away as she turned into a tree. Here she's contorting in, in what looks like a rather painful way. Her feet, uh, the bottom of her legs are becoming roots. Um, and her face is contorted. It doesn't look like it's very pleasant as she becomes this tree. And Apollo is again reaching towards her, actually touching her here, grabbing for her um, and looking somewhat at the same time horrified, terrified as he leans back away from this transformation. So uh, a very different take on the, on the story here. Here's a picture of a sculpture from 1624 by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, Apollo and Daphne. Uh, unfortunately, I only have this one angle on it, but um, it's, a, it's a useful angle as it shows. If we could just see their bodily positions, uh, Daphne is turned away from Apollo. Um, and again, she seems to be here almost ascending upwards, even though at the same time she is rooting downwards into the ground as she becomes a tree. And we can see beautifully how motion has been captured by the whipping of Apollo's um, uh, garments around him as he chases after Daphne. Um, so a beautiful way that, again, transformation has been captured. The image captures that moment of transformation. And so we see her in both human and uh, plant forms becoming one to the other. Uh, we get the motion implied, even though it's a still image. And again, her turning away from him, rejecting him while he races after her. Um, a rather beautiful image, I think, here, as we see the, her fingers starting to become branches and the leaves sprouting from them. A really beautiful sculpture, I think. And finally, uh, this is my favorite in a sense because it really makes my point for me that in many ways um, this story uh, becomes more about Apollo and Apollo becoming a poet and uh, making Daphne into something for him to sing about, to poetize. And this is, of course, what Petrarch does, what Sidney does. They poetize about the love that they cannot have. Then it is really about Daphne herself. Because if you look at this image, 
who do we see? Well, it really just appears to be Apollo. And he has his violin here. He's about to start singing, looking off into the distance as though he is waiting for the muse to inspire him. He's already wearing his laurel wreath. Uh, he has the bow in one hand, and that's not his archery bow. Rather, it's the bow that he will be using to uh, uh, play his instrument. Um, so this seems to be, it's just Apollo. But if we look to the center right, excuse me, center left background, you can see in the very back, um, Daphne just starting to change. She's really the background to what's more important, Apollo becoming a singer, becoming a poet. And on the next slide, we'll zoom in on that image. So there she is. You can see her now, um, uh, Daphne, just the very corner. So she's almost an afterthought to this, this painting. Um, uh, but I think that's the, the painter here is giving us, Doso Dosi, is giving us a, a wonderful uh, insight into what this story came to mean. That Daphne, as the tree, as the initial object of desire, ultimately is less important than the insubstantial voice, the spirit that Apollo will then sing, the stories that he will tell and that others will tell because of what they cannot have. And Daphne here is really just a symbol, an object for what you can't have, what you want, what, what is beyond your grasp, but what we must reach for nonetheless. And we can fulfill only through our poetry, through our art, through our imagination. Um, and so it really makes that point very beautifully for me, I think just by the way Daphne is portrayed. Um, and you might notice in the background, we can see this town and it almost looks like they have skyscrapers or something like that, like like modern architecture. Uh, I'm not quite sure what those are supposed to be, but obviously they're not skyscrapers, some sort of Renaissance era towers, uh, castles, no doubt. So a few things to review. Greek and Roman myths, um, they were so valued by the Renaissance uh, artists because of their extremes of human passions that they display. These desires that cause someone to uh, be so angry that they would dismember another person. Someone who is so shocked by their uh, by what they've seen that they are transformed into an animal. Someone who resists the love of another person so much that they are willing to be turned into a tree. Someone who desires someone else so much that they will love them even after they have been turned into a tree. So it explores these extremes and again the paradoxes of human experience. That desire leads us to pain, but pain and lack and inadequacy often lead us then to producing something else, producing something new uh, in our voice, our art, something that is insubstantial yet real. And Acteon and Diana most powerfully focuses on the painful effects of desire and the recognition of a fundamental inadequacy, human inadequacy, that we are all missing something, that there's something we desire. That's one of, I think, the main ideas of that story. Whereas Apollo and, Dina and Daphne is about the sublimation of desire, its redirection, and how poetry, how art recuperates the self, reconstructs the self. To dig into those ideas a little bit more uh, specifically, um, the mystery and danger of femininity from a masculine patriarchal perspective. That is, from this perspective, there's always something desirable about the female body and femininity, yet also mysterious and dangerous about it. So that ang masculine anxiety, the recognition of, a, of an inadequacy, of a need for this other thing, yet a fear of it at the same time. And the importance of voice, both as an expression of spirit and self. Our voice is, uh, it's how we announce who we are, but it is just sound. It is air. It is insubstantial. It is our spirit emerging from ourself in some way. So it is who we are, but at the same time, it is something that we produce from our bodies uh, as an action. And voice as a sign of power, or voice in its relationship to power. Voice as something that can command, but also something that can entreat or beg. Uh, 
And these are different forms, perhaps, of power, the power to pray, the power to command, and where this power comes from, how voice in different situations um, is used to negotiate the relationships in particular between men and women and the power dynamics between men and women. This, when we get into Petrarch and Sidney, of course, and, and Shakespeare and all these other sonnet writers, the idea of who can speak and who is silenced becomes crucial to the meaning of those poems. And that does it for this lecture on uh, myth and Renaissance lyric. If you have any questions, of course, you can contact me on Blackboard, email, text. Um, otherwise, have a great week and cheers. Good luck with your work.